Hey everybody, JJ Cooper, Jeff Ponce, another Baseball America Prospect podcast. We are rolling along. We are doing six different division by division kind of state mid-season, ah, not mid-season at this point, 65% of the way through the year type state of the organizations for all 30 teams. Trade deadline is done. We've updated our top 30s for all 30 organizations now multiple times in season. Uh, I think we've actually done it now multiple times this, you know, in, in the past two weeks, uh, to be honest. But so we're kind of taking stock, taking a chance to look at kind of the good and the bad uh, of what kind of each organization is kind of doing, where things stand as we head into the tail end of the 2024 major and minor league season. And Jeff, the thing that does jump out when we talk about the good and the bad is there, I don't know if it's easy if you could possibly have bad more than you start off with when you're talking about Chicago White Sox and their 2024 season, one that I think if you want to go men in black, you know, could be one of those seasons you want to have erased from your memory. Um, Pretty much anyone involved, I would imagine, but kind of, you know, as we dive in good to talk to you again. And where do you kind of see the White Sox as we sit here, as they kind of evoke comparisons to the, 62 Mets and the 2003 Tigers. Yeah, I mean, this is obviously gone as bad as it possibly could. You go back to 2020, 2021, um, there was a lot of hope around this organization that they had a good young core of players, an exciting young core, and were a team to contend with over the next four to five years. That really has not come to fruition. It's been the complete opposite. Just about everything that could go wrong um, from an injury and a performance standpoint has, and even a lot of the assets that they had that would have been um, top assets in the trade market three years ago, you know, have sort of shrunk into s- secondary pieces and trades. I mean, Eloy Jimenez was just traded a few weeks ago or last week for, you know, as a, uh, a platoon bat for a playoff team. Right. And that's not something you would have thought when this guy was ranked as a top 10 prospect in all of baseball. That said, I think the positive side of things is there are some really exciting players here at the top of their system. A couple of left-handed pitchers that I think probably rank among the best lefties in the minor leagues. Um, And, you know, it's not the most talented system, but there's definitely some things to like here um, with the White Sox. Uh, Though, like I said, it's it's not going to be ranking, you know, in the top five systems in the game. There are some some really nice pieces uh, within the system. That's maybe one positive, one shred of positivity to take away from this dreadful season. So, okay, before we move on from it, I do want to kind of take a step back and look at it. It's like, yeah, when as you noted, this is the team that won 93 games in 2021 and won 93 games at the time with, uh, you know, Yoan Mankata having a very good season, Tim Anderson having a very good season. This was a team that uh, had a solid pitching staff and young pitchers. Like this was a team that looked like at that time that there's was, you know, relatively well set up. Obviously injuries have played a role, but the other thing that does jump out is it can't be that you push this group of talent through and then you kind of don't have any follow-up and It's not that they didn't have any follow-up. I would say that the follow-up has kind of has has fallen flat. Um, You know, this is a team that we talk about kind of the natural life cycle. We say that the Orioles are headed this direction right now, which is you have these incredible top of the top of the rankings farm systems. They're supposed to dip back down to they're supposed to return to, to more normal because you graduate those players. And if you're good, you not only graduate those players, but you graduate them and you're drafting later and you're not, you know, you're trading away prospects to acquire big league talent. And so the system fails off. But the thing that does jump out is, is that, and this is something that I can't get out of my head. Like if you talked about in 2021, the worst farm systems in baseball, the White Sox, I would say were dead last and there was a gap between them and anyone else. And so kind of what happened is, is I would also say is, is that 2021 team did have Jose Abreu at, at first base. 
It had Yasmani Grandal having a very good season at catcher, but he was 32. It had, you know, it had Adam Eaton in right field, who was probably at the very tail end of his career. You know, it, there were veterans on those teams. And as those veterans kind of aged out or hit free agency, they didn't have anything behind them to replace them. And having players like, like Andrew Vaughn kind of struggle to, to develop, they have had Garrett Crochet now healthy, be really, really good this year. But I, I, I guess the, the one question I want to ask before we dive into their prospects more is knowing what we know now, like, is this a, a case of a team that we were over opt- overly optimistic about their path in 2019, 2020, 2021, or is it one where there's got to be some hard questions on why did these players not get better? Yeah, I think you can kind of point to a few things. I think you can point to their lack of adjusting to the modern game over the last decade. Um, I think they sit right alongside the Rockies in terms of teams that have the least amount of data analysts in the game. They've kind of rejected a lot of that data first thinking within the organization. Um, they made a really unusual hire with a guy, you know, who is well into retirement and Tony La Russa, who also had some off the field questions. He's obviously a hall of fame manager, one of the greats of all time, but probably not a good fit for a young Latin team that was, um, you know, uh, very swaggy and kind of vibrant, probably not a great fit in terms of the personality for that locker room. And I think things kind of started to tip down from there when they made that move. I think everybody looked at it immediately and was like, Hey, Tony Lewis is a great baseball guy, a hall of famer. There's no questions there of what he's done and what his contributions have been to the game over the last 30 years. But for the here and now he was not a good fit. It was old school thinking, you know, it was, kind of playing off of, you know, ownerships, relationships and friendships that he had had within the game, uh, as opposed to taking a step back and finding the right candidate to sort of lead the charge there, trying to rework their player development. I think it's still a question mark when you sort of look at this organization and even the players that they they target in the draft. When you compare and contrast them with the Rockies, the Rockies have a deep, exciting farm system. And you can sort of look at their last two to three drafts and how well they've done in the international market and say, well, at least there is depth there with some high end talent. You could point to an organization like that and say, hey, there's maybe a future here where we look here and there's a handful of players that I think are really exciting prospects. It drops off pretty quickly and you sort of have to wonder where the reinforcements are going to come from. It's a better system than it's been over the last handful of years. They've added a lot of players via trades, via the draft, but it's still, you know, you start to get to 20 in the system and it's, it's still not going to reinforce this major league roster the way that they need to. Oh, and by the way, they can't pick in the top 10 next year either because of, you know, um, the rules, bigger market team, et cetera, the rules, all that sort of thing. So that's really concerning that even though you're bad, you're not going to be able to sort of um, benefit from the fruits of your labor and looking at other teams, just record wise, they're cleared as the worst team in, in baseball by 13 or 14 games. You know, the difference between them and like the next worst team is the difference between that team and like a first place team. So I think you look at that and, if you're a White Sox fan, it really turns your stomach. So just so much has gone wrong here that it's just mismanagement by the organization, frankly. I'm not a giant. I, I got to say the farm system, it's got some really interesting top end guys. I agree. It is not one set up to turn this around right now. It is a long ways away from that, in my opinion. And I look at the key thing that I've really kind of struggle with on this is, okay, who are their hang your hat position player prospects? Because Colson Montgomery is their top position player prospect. And he's a, I, I don't think there's any doubt at this point that he's going to be a big leaguer um, a, and very potentially a solid big leaguer. But at the same time, there are, you know, it's not a great season. There are still defensive questions where he plays long term and kind of approach and all where I would say that it's easy to envision a scenario where he ends up being a very good kind of, if I say second tier player, that's damning him more than I want to here, but complimentary player, right? You don't want, I would say that right now, 
we got done talking about the AL East and in the AL East, when we talk about kind of the, you know, the, the Carson Williams and the junior Camineros, those are guys who you can easily kind of come to a scenario where it's like, that's a cornerstone type guy. Who are the cornerstone type position player prospects in this White Sox system? Yeah, I guess it's, it's Colson Montgomery. And I don't think it, from what he's shown this year, I think the, you know, Things have gone about as bad as they possibly could. He's in a great hitting environment. He hasn't hit. Um, he's still young for the level, and there's skills to like. There's some things under the hood that, you know, maybe you look at it and say, I'm not as concerned as the slash line. But you got to produce. You got to post. And he hasn't done that, and it just feels as if he probably needs another at least half a season in AAA and, and a good off season to get back to where he was. Um and then you look at a guy like Edgar Cuero, who's an interesting prospect. He's always been able to hit. I don't know how much impact is in the bat. And then there's defensive questions. So there really aren't a, a lot. And I wouldn't say there's any slam dunk above average regular in the system at the moment. He is yeah. as risky as juggling nitroglycerin. Let me be clear. But if you asked me to, to name you a could be a cornerstone type position player prospect in the system, I think, Jeff, you know exactly where I'm going, which is let's go way down this list to George Wolkow, who is who may never have a successful season in double A if he doesn't continue to make massive improvements because his strikeout rate is one where um, it, it, it's at a level that, you know, Joey Gallo looks at it and, you know, kind of turns away and it's like, uh, that, that, <laughs> that, that, that's too much. But that being said, he is a really special athlete for someone that big. He hits the ball really hard. There's a lot there that could all come together. He's at least, I guess the way I put it is, is he's different than a lot of these guys in that he's, it's hard for me to envision saying, oh, he's going to end up being a nice complimentary player. I can't really envision the complimentary player version of him. I kind of envision it being more of like, well, he could be a lesser version of James Wood if it all comes together, or he could be never never added to a 40-man roster, left unprotected and unpicked in a Rule 5 draft in a couple of years, kind of level of range of variance. Is that fair? Yeah, he could be a guy that we're writing about in uh, multiple Rule 5 uh, you know, previews about, hey, this guy's interesting, maybe somebody takes a shot on him kind of deal, but without like any, you know, real vigor behind him getting picked potentially. Um, or as you said, I think the upside is there. He could be an exciting player. You know, Brooks Baldwin has been a nice little breakout for them, but there's not a lot of upside there necessarily. He's not a guy that hits for a lot of power. Um, just sort of a hit tool guy, kind of somebody that would have been reminiscent of, you know, a corner outfielder in the eighties or something. Um, can, can I ask you that? Like, that's where I feel like when I look at this organization right now, and let me just say, I think Chris Getz has kind of one of the toughest jobs in the world here in that he was, he took over something that was already, you know, they, they, the Titanic had already hit the iceberg at the time he took over, right? Like, so you, you can't hang what may end up being one of the worst, which probably is going to be one of the worst teams in Major League Baseball history. You can't hang that on, you know, on him. Like, oh, look at what he took over. But then on top of that, he's also got to kind of re kind of turn around the Titanic here and head it in a different direction when it comes to player development and scouting and all that. But the knock I would have on this right now is I look at this is when it comes to position players, I feel like there are too many of the nothing against Brooks Baldwin, who's a great story, but like enough way too many of the Jacob Gonzalez Brooks Baldwin types where you're like, they're fine, right? Like yeah. They could make the majors if you're, they could be a second division regular. Maybe if you're, you know, maybe you get fortunate one of them's a first division regular, but it's a whole lot of guys who could check that box of played the big leagues. But I just don't see a whole lot of, th I see a lot more pitchers on this list who have a chance yeah. to have significant impacts than I do position players. Yeah. I think they got some interesting players in this draft and the trade deadline and guys like Caleb Bonmer. Um, you know, Albertus and uh, Gerald Perez from the Dodgers. Samuel Zavala is a guy that's shown some spurts of being an interesting player, but has not really taken a step forward this year. 
Casey Salke, you know, was is is an interesting player. I think Nick McLean's an interesting player. But I think like you're looking at a bunch of guys where if they're 45s, 50s, you're you're kind of happy if that's what they turn out to be, not necessarily players they're going to push for, you know, 60s. They don't have any 60s in the system. And the ones that they do have are guys like Noah Schultz that are pretty far away still, or in Hagen Smith. That's a great way to kind of take us to the Guardians, who are right now the the class of the AL Central again this year. But also, I would say, have a farm system with a number of guys who I do think could be those 55s, those 60s, those guys yeah. who you're like, hey, this is what it looks like. Like, if you're comparing farm systems, the Guardians farm system should be significantly worse than the White Sox right now. It's not. It's. I think it's deeper. I think it's better, in my opinion. Even if, I will say, like having a, a, a Schultz, you know, at the top of the list is a really great way. Hagen Smith is a great way to start, but I, I really do still like where the guardians are. Even after they made some pretty aggressive trades, I'm, I'm not, I think both of us kind of surprised that Alexander Clemmy uh, went in a trade for what I would describe as kind of a, a solid regular outfielder, but not an impact uh, outfielder in the Elaine Thomas acquisition. But where do you see this guardians farm system at again on a team that let's just be acknowledge is you know a, a not just a playoff contender but a team that's can, been contending for the best record in the American League for most of the year. Yeah, against some juggernauts too, like the Orioles and and the Yankees. Um, and they've kind of been even keeled throughout the season. They haven't had those dips as great as the Yankees have or even the Orioles over the last couple of months. Um, they added you know the number one pick in the draft, a top three player in the draft. You know, obviously there's there's some debate as to who the best is. But, you know, a guy like Travis Bizana that could potentially move really fast. I'm going to be out there next week to, to catch up with Travis a little bit. Um, but I think, you know, one of the one of the things and one of the angles I'm going to sort of take on this is, th is this a guy that, you know, potentially could help this team out down the stretch if need be or could be up to the majors really quick next year, a la Wyatt Langford. Um, and, you know, behind that, they have guys that have taken big steps forward. Ralphie Velasquez has really hit. There's defensive questions, but the bat in terms of contact and power, I mean, we saw his batting practice in the Futures game. It was the best of anybody that was out there. I mean, he was pound for pound, contact, power to all parts of the park. He's still super young. There's a lot to believe in there. They've had some unfortunate injuries with a guy like Chase DeLotter who just keeps re-injuring his foot. Um, but once he's healthy and back on track, it wouldn't shock me if he's fast-tracked to the major leagues could give them another dimension of a really exciting, you know, five tool type of player. Um, Kyle Manzardo, you know, got some opportunities at the big leagues this year, still a, a great combination of hit tool and power. Um, I think he develops into an average or better regular. Um, Angel Janow is a guy that um, really exciting, kind of a classic guardians prospect, middle infielder, a little bit undersized switch hitter, but has some tools to like. Um, and then Jackson Churio's younger brother, Jason Churio, has had a good season. Um, he's a top 100 prospect. Um, and I think there's a lot to like here in the top five, six, cool. even seven. Um, and then you have guys like CJ Kafis, who have just taken a massive step forward under the Guardians player development. He's shown more power than I think we even expected he would. Um, it's outproduced some of the underlying data, but he's a guy that just gets a lot of flush barrels consistently. Um, and then another guy that I know we talked about prior to updating the list here is Cooper Engel, who's catching for the first time, had an arm injury when he was in college. He's always had excellent plate skills. I think it's almost twice as many walks as he has strikeouts. He's hitting for some power. He's playing a position every day. Um, he's throwing out runners at a really high clip, which is good to see from a guy that did have some, some arm issue concerns. There's a lot of good development going on within the Guardian system. And I'll even put it out there. I think over the last five to six years, the thing, the hallmark of the system, the thing that the Guardians can hang their hat on is they've kind of been the kings of depth. They've always had a really good system depth. So they've been able to trade guys like Alex Clemmy, et cetera, and not miss a beat. Though I'm sure they wish they had Junior Cameron Arrow right now. So or to buy his fire, about, like, matter. See, this is where I, I also really think, in addition to the fact that they had the most money to spend in the draft. So in addition to Bazana, it's guys like Joey Oki and guys like that, high upside guys. But 
take the draft out of this for a minute. You mentioned CJ Kafis making a big step forward. Tugboat, Matt Wilkinson, Tugboat Wilkinson. I, we're still a little skeptical, to be honest. I want to see him do it at higher levels, but no one can deny he's having one of the best seasons in the minors. He has value now in a trade that there's not, he had no value in a trade, to be honest, coming into the season, you know, considering what he's done. Daniel Schneeman, who's kind of carved out a role for them at the big league level. You mentioned Ingle. I like their pitching, like the guys like Parker Messick, who can really pitch, Ryan Webb, who can really pitch, who's not even on our 30 because they're so deep. This is a system where there's just a whole lot of guys who have paths to big league roles of some sort. And that's even that's not even giving it like that little bit of of Guardians magic where it's like, okay, they seem to always have pitchers who find another gear, uh, you know, as pros, you know, in their development. A guy like Jackson Humphreys, who's, you know, we've written about it, you know, in our updates, like, I don't think we've seen anywhere close to what we're going to see from Jackson Humphreys this year. He's battled, he kind of had an illness early in the season, kind of derailed his season, but that's a high upside arm. And that's one of like five or six of these kind of high upside lefties, even in the system that they have. I just feel like overall for a, for a team that's competing at the big league level. Now winning the lottery does a, does a lot for you. Let's be clear, but to, to be where they are right now, this is a system that is really deep is really interesting. We're not even mentioning, like, we don't know. I mean, you could rank Daniel Espino five in this system, or you could make rank him 35 if you wanted to, because who knows what he's going to be. You know, we're hoping that he comes back from what has been a pretty serious shoulder injury, but he's kind of like a bonus. You don't like they, they can be okay. Even if he doesn't come back for them, it's a really interesting system. It's been a, a great season for the guardians, both at the big league level and at the minor league level. The next team we're going to talk about, the Tigers, I would say, we could say it's been a very good season at the minor league level. We can't say the same thing about the big league level. So, Jeff, if the Guardians, if it's all going right for the Guardians, I would say with the Tigers, we can't say that it's all gone right this year. But I really do feel better about where Detroit is than I have probably at any time in quite a while. You know, that's my assessment of it. But how do you assess it? Yeah, and I think that with the change um, within the front office over the last couple of years, just in terms of personnel and who's making the decisions there, I think that you have to be a little bit more confident in the decisions that they make in the draft outside of the first round, the types of players they're going after, you know, they always seem to fall back on very boring college performers and they're not doing that anymore. We're getting all these high upside preps over the last couple of years. Max Clark has had a good year. Kevin McGonagall has been one of the best breakout prospects in the minor leagues. Bryce Rayner, I think, will, will follow in those footsteps. They went out and they acquired some interesting players like Darren Lorenzo. Um, you know, how you Lee wasn't this year, but was last year. He's another guy that if you look under the hood, the numbers are really good. There's a lot of good positional players in this system which was not a hallmark of the Alex Avila teams and that whole rebuild where it was so pitching heavy. And, you know, as we've always Wait, said, for, for, okay. for, for to get can one I, pitching prospect that works, you're probably going to have three that fail. And you kind of saw that. Can I interject? Would you say not a hallmark? It's not just the uh, Al Avila time. You have to go back. You could go back to the 20th century. <laughs> if you say, Hey, I want to get to the fifth, you know, I want, What's the fourth or fifth most successful position player that they've produced homegrown? Like they don't have five in the 21st century. I, I would argue like regulars who ended up having solid roles for more than just a couple of years. It's been that bleak. And that's where they, uh, sorry to interrupt, but that's where they turned it around. I, I completely agree with you. Like, and if you look at this now to have a top of your system that starts with Jackson, Joe, Max Clark and Kevin McGonigal, there aren't a whole lot of teams that can compete with that. Is there? No, I think just even the top five in general. I know Jace Young, depending upon how you fall on the Jace Young debate, um, still a pretty good prospect. And I think in a lot of these systems that we've been talking about already, a guy that ranks easily in the top five of most systems. Um, and then a guy like Bryce Rayner, who I think you could make an argument could turn out to be the best prep position player taken in this draft. It's between him and Connor Griffin. And I think, you know, if you look at the, the – the track record and where he played high school baseball and the best high school baseball conference, arguably in the country. Um, 
there in Southern California. He's a guy that has some track record. He's bigger. He has some tools. Under their player development, you feel a lot better because things have definitely changed around Lakeland in terms of what their approach has been and the type of players that they've churned out and how guys have gotten better just from an all around standpoint. Um, it's exciting, you know, there's, and, and it's kind of across the board here. They got some catching depth. They got a bunch of middle infielders. They got some outfielders as well. They still have some pitching with Jackson Job, And I know he's a little bit more underrated, but Jaden Ham's a guy that we've had in top 100 discussions. I think Ty Madden still has a chance to be a pretty good major league starter, maybe at the back end of a rotation. Same with Troy Melton. Kyder Montero has shown some flashes in the big leagues. So Brent Perger had a great time. debut. Yeah, exactly. I was going to bring that up too. Yeah, exactly. So there's a lot to like with this top 15. And even as you get a little bit further down the list, I know um, I have some friends in Tigers player development. Uh, Fran Yerber uh, Montilla is a guy that they they speak of very highly. So there's a lot to like here. And they did a good job in the draft again this year of reinforcing it with some good talent. I think when you throw also into that, like we talked about the catching depth, but what Dylan Dingler has done this year, Dylan Dingler has long been kind of this, interesting catcher for them because the defense is solid, but it's like, okay, is he, he's got some power, but is he ever going to hit enough to get to it? And I, I still have at least a little bit of skepticism, but he's really had a breakout year. When we talk about, again, as we go through this, the, the key thing you want to see in pretty much any of these organizations, everyone should have some guys that you can point to and say, that guy got better this year. Well, Dylan Dingler absolutely got better this year has kind of gone from he could be a backup catcher to where now they're seeing, okay, can this guy be a regular? And which, by the way, he better keep it up because, as you mentioned, they've got multiple catchers behind him in the system to kind of keep an eye on as well. But then you got a Montilla who's kind of developing. You've got, you, you've just got, you've got guys in this organization now who you look at and say, that guy's going to be a regular. Max Clark's going to be a regular. The question with him, is he going to be a five regular? Is he going to be a six? Is he going to be a seven? But it would be hard to imagine he's not going to be a regular. Kevin McGonigal is going to be a regular. Like Kevin McGon And by the way, we haven't mentioned the other one I want to mention was uh, How You Lee, who we saw at the Futures game as well. But that's a guy who is better than I think a lot of people may fully understand right now. That's another guy who could easily have a path to being a solid regular. Better defender than I think a lot of people may, you know, may expect um especially what we saw last year kind of like the the first wave of tigers prospects are I, the the change we've talked about it probably too much at this point is is the change of approach from where they drafted on the position player side they drafted athletes who they hoped would hit to teach to hit and that never worked but now they were teaching they were drafting hitters and then teaching them to play defense which is a much better approach but we've seen kind of like the colt keeps of the world and guys like that but now you add in the clarks the McGonagall's. Guys like that, Lee, who are like guys who can play defense and hit, well, that's the perfect combo. That's that's obviously the the goal that you're aiming for. And the thing I just look at this is is they held on to to Tarek Skubal, which gives them a if they hold on to him, they they could trade him for a king's ransom after the season potentially. But if they hold on to him, that gives you a front of the rotation ace. That's what that guy is. If he can stay healthy. They're working in some pitchers to go with them. This is a team that I do think isn't that far away from being in contention, even as they have had still, you know, they're Spencer Torkelson not developing obviously hurts. There's there have been several of those type of situations. Casey Mize has has struggled, you know, it was a one-one pick and has struggled to stay healthy at times. Um, but even with all that, I, I do feel like that this is an organization that's kind of in a better spot than they've been in quite a while. Um, and we'll see obviously where that goes, but if they're in a better spot, okay. The, the award for in a way better spot now than we thought they were coming into the season has to go to the Kansas city Royals. I would say that at this point, if you are saying who is your surprise big league team of 2024, it's, it's the Royals, right, Jeff? Yeah, and I'll just give myself a pat in the back for my off-season picks. I actually picked this as the surprise team of 2024. I think you look at Bobby Witt Jr., arguably the best player in baseball. Certainly, one of the best Yankees fans are going to—they're going to hunt you down. I will tell you right now for that. Hey, Aaron Judge doesn't play shortstop, all right? I think I didn't say best hitter. I think that Aaron Judge is the best hitter in the game. I think Bobby Witt might be two or three. Shohei Otani certainly is within that, that conversation. 
when you talk about a guy who's, you know, the middle of your order, shortstop leader, a guy that you can hang your hat on for the next seven to eight years. It's a guy like Bobby Witt Jr. They did some things in the off season to reinforce this pitching staff behind Cole Reagan's all-star pretty good at the trade deadline. They went out, they reinforced um, the bullpen a little bit. Um, there's still some nice kind of underrated players there. And then you look at the top of the system. They they got two or three top 100 prospects. It's not as deep as some other systems um, within this division or within the game. Um, but there's still some nice pieces throughout. Um, the, there may be only be a handful of, you know, impact regulars here. You know, Jack Caglione could be a really good player. Blake Mitchell could be a really good player when you consider he can catch hits for a ton of power, gets on base a ton. Carter Jensen's kind of the same way. And then a lot of arms that could factor into this as well that do have some big stuff and could develop over the next couple of years. Um, yeah, things have gone really, really well at the major league level. And after being the worst farm system in baseball, according to us, a year ago, I think they're going to move up their rankings a little bit with their draft and, and some of the other developments here. So I think there's some positives to take away from this. But, um, you know, kudos to that front office because they've done a really good job of reinforcing that major league roster, number one. And that's where I did want to spend a little bit of time here. Like the farm system still has a ways to go, I'd say. But what I give them a lot of credit, I give JJ Piccolo and the, the front office credit for is, is they were, okay, for one, they did a great job in free agency before the season to kind of bolster the, the starting pitching staff. And that's been, I, I'd say that they probably did the best job of anyone out there as far as acquiring starting pitchers on a budget and, and getting really great production out of that. On top of the fact that they basically heisted Cole Reagans from the Rangers last year in the role as Chapman trade, all that together. But then now what they did at the deadline, they knew they needed bullpen help. And they managed to, I, I would say, do a really good job of, of kind of building up that bullpen. That does not guarantee you that if bullpens are volatile, that it's all going to work. But adding a Hunter Harvey, adding a Lucas Herzig, and doing those in deals that I don't think are really going to come back and they, I don't think that those are regrettable deals on their end as far as the players they gave up. I like a Mason Barnett, you know, can like a Caden Wallace, but those are the kind of players that you can trade because you do believe that you have other players of those talents in your system. I, I just look at where they are now and say, okay, this is a team that I, I never would imagine, maybe you did because you, you predicted it, but I never would imagine coming in the season that they would not just be on the cusp of a playoff team but be a legitimate playoff contender yeah and i think like you, you look at this team and there's some pieces in this lineup like mikhail garcia is an underrated player um really good bats of ball skills good approach he hits the ball a heck of a lot harder than people think 24 years old you got some runway with this guy until he was injured last year Vinny pasquantino i think was somebody that everyone really liked and thought was a future all-star Salvador Perez, still a really good leader at 34, still a guy that can hit. Um, Hutter Renfro, just a solid regular. Um, maybe more of a 45 now than a 50 like he's been, but can hit enough, can play enough in the outfield. Um, they got some versatile players like MJ Melendez, Michael Macy. Um, you know, Freddie Fermin has been pretty good for them as well. Uh, and, you know, they've, they've been able, like I said, to put together a decent pitching staff with, you know, Seth Lugo. Cole Reagans, Michael Lorenzen, um, Michael Waka, Brady Singer, I think doesn't get, doesn't get the love that Brady Singer really deserves. He's been really good over the last three years. And now that you add a guy like Lucy, Lucas Ersig at the back of this bullpen with Hunter Harvey, they got some firepower in that pen as well. I mean, again, I, I'm, I'm probably the biggest member of the Walter Pennington fan club. That's not Walker Pennington's you know, family. Um, but to trade him for Michael Lorenzen, you do that trade a hundred times out of a hundred for what the Royals need right now. I, I just feel like that this is an organization we, I talked about it with the White Sox, what, what Chris gets is being asked to do. I do think trying to turn around an organization when you were already part of that organization, which is what JJ Piccolo is also being asked to do. He's been, he was a key member of the Royals teams that, that won, you know, the world series that went to back to back world series and won it in 15 but now he's being asked to kind of change things there 
And I feel like that they're, they're pulling it off, which is not easy to do. That's a very difficult thing to pull off. And I, I look at where the Royals are now. I would still say like on the farm system side, it, it's something where they've made steps forward, but at the same time, they're still kind of making up for the fact that let's just be honest, like the Asa Lacey uh, injuries have played a large role in that, but having a top five pick like Asa Lacey, who hasn't really gotten you anything, anything. having, you know, they, I'm not a giant fan of the, go cheap with the top 10 pick and then spread it around like that could come back and bite you. I think that's happened so far with Frank Mazzucato, who they took a couple of years ago in the first round. Like the, 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 the numbers look good at the same time. It's hard for me to envision a guy who's sitting in the high eighties, kind of having a whole lot of, of big league success. It hasn't really, the stuff has backed up, not taken a step forward in pro ball. But that being said, like, you know, you look at what, what they've got in, in Blake Mitchell, you look at, Obviously, Jack Caglione, who they added, is a, a you know a very uh, high ceiling guy. You know, I know that they're starting him out two way. I think we both think at the end of the day, he's probably going to be you know more of a, a slugger. Um, but I, Gavin Cross coming back from injury this year, really like the arms like Blake Walters, Chandler Champlain. This is a system that's definitely more interesting than it was a year ago. But on top of that. The other key thing that's happened here is, is with Bobby Witt Jr. turning into one of the three best players in all of baseball, it's a whole different dynamic when you have a team now. Winning's contagious. I mean, it does put you in a different perspective going forward when you've now had this season like this to, to build on. And kind of when we talk about winning being contagious, that takes us to our last team uh, in our AL Central review. and. I feel like for the Twins, again, there's a lot of optimism, more optimism than we probably expected to be talking about in an AL Central podcast if we had predicted this before the <laughs> season. But we are talking about a division. I, I love this stat because I never would have imagined before the season. The division that has three teams in it who have a better record than anyone in the AL West, which, of course, like, like we all expected coming into the year, that this would be the division doing that because everyone talked about how bad the, the Central was. But I look at and this is an organization that I feel like has a really good lineup now at the big league level with a lot of young talent with guys like Royce Lewis is just please stay healthy Royce Lewis so we can see what you can do over the course of a full season guys like that guys like Brooks Lee moving in but then we talk about it we want to see guys in the minors who take that leap forward like to have who's your who's your guy that you say wow that guy's a lot better than he was coming into the year if you ask that to the twins, they have to answer with, okay, do you want our position player leap or do you want our yeah, pitcher sure. leap? Because I, I can answer you Luke Kieschel and I can answer you Zebby Matthews, Jeff, and whichever one I answer you, I could make a case that that's one of the bigger leaps in the minors this year. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, Zebby Matthews is a guy that's in line to potentially win our minor league pitcher of the year. Um, he's just been so good. I mean, it's ticked down a little bit in AAA, but – I think some of that is just learning when he has to throw the ball in the zone and when he can maybe throw it a little bit out of the zone. If that's what your problem is, just throw less strikes. Um, that's a pretty good problem to have. The stuff is there. You know, we've talked about the quality of the fastball. He's got power across his pitch mix. I think that when it's all said and done, this guy's going to be a really good mid-rotation arm for them. Um, and Luke Kieschel is as really broken out as a versatile position prospect that, can fill multiple roles in the infield, multiple roles in the outfield. He's not a standout defender anywhere, but can be competent across a bunch of different areas while providing above average offense uh, and does a little bit of everything offensively too, in terms of being able to hit, get on base, hit for power, run a little bit as well. So he's an exciting player. And then you got your big three up top and Walker Jenkins, who's among the best prospects in the game. Uh, Emmanuel Rodriguez, who's among the best prospects in the game. And then a guy like Brooks Lee that I think we both think will just be a really steady average regular or better. Um, so it's a good system. There's still depth here. And it's one where you can kind of point to a handful of guys here and say, hey, there's more coming in terms of re reinforcements over the next couple of years that could really strengthen this team. Um, you know, if a guy like Royce Lewis does stay healthy and continue to produce and show what he can do. So and Jose Miranda, Jose Miranda at the major league level might be one of the biggest breakouts and, and it, biggest improvements from an MLB perspective. So I think there's a lot to hang your hat on here. 
it's a good system. And, you know, over the last couple of years, there's been some points where it looked like this Twins team, major league wise and minor league wise, were kind of headed in the wrong direction. I don't think you can say that now. I mean, they have a, a guy that was drafted pretty much in the first round and Kyle DeBarge all the way down in their 20s. There's not a lot of teams that have that level of depth of potential impact players and some exciting guys. So it it's a good group. I, the, the thing that jumps out to me about them is, is, and again, like you mentioned, and this is a group now that, okay, this is a team that has, with Correa, the free agent acquisition, Correa, Royce Lewis, Jose Miranda, and Brooks Lee. Okay, you know, that's, you're good. Like if they're all healthy, that's that's an infield right there. And then you throw in, you know, Buxton being kind of more Byron Buxton this year. Their outfield is pretty good. They're, but they're, then the pitching, to get what they got from Simeon Woods Richardson this year, to get what they've gotten from Bailey Ober, to have these Woods Richardson's kind of homegrown, he was traded, but to have these guys who came up from the farm system to kind of really bolster a rotation that needed it has been kind of crucial. But then, you, as you mentioned, kind of you look at this, you go, you go further on. Connor Prelip's back on the mound. I'm very intrigued by, you know, what that's a guy who's now in their middle, their, 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 their teens. Um, you know, when we were talking about the White Sox and I was talking about George Wolkow, well, the kind of less scary version of that may be Brandon Winokur, who's yeah. six foot five playing shortstop and has been better offensively than I expected him to be. I thought that it might be kind of a, a bigger adjustment period for him than, it, than what it's been. It means that a guy like Marco Raya, who we still want to see get stretched out more, but a guy like Marco Raya is kind of a second tier pitching prospect for them. I would say at this point, they have guys like Andrew Morris. They have there's pitching depth here. I, I would say in addition, Corey to Lewis, like, really yeah. interesting pitching prospect. You know, knuckleball guy too. It, it is again, there's a lot of guys. Diver De Los Santos, far away guy who's kind of interesting. There's a lot here to like. And the key thing I would say about it, though, is, is, and there's a lot here to like in a system that they don't have a whole lot of, like if you said, okay, let's look ahead to 2025, we just talked about it. There's a lot of young big leaguers here where you're like, okay, they're kind of covered at this position and that position and this position and that position where they, I mean, they've gotten burned. Let's be honest. They've gotten burned a little bit with trading away some prospects at times. Like Spencer Steer would look nice on this team and we could, you know, and so would Yaner Cano. And, you know, there's there's a, a variety of guys we could highlight like that. Yeah. And Carnacion Strand. Yeah, there's a bunch. Like, yeah, Christian and Carnacion Strand. But for all that being said, you know, this is a system that's printing out, that's churning out players like that, that you look at and say, they now have a depth that they haven't had both in the big leagues, I would say, but also in the farm system where it's like, okay, as they have guys hit free agency, as they have guys age out. Because again, when you look at that outfield, I would say that between, you know, Larnax having a solid year, but, you know, between Kepler and Kirloff, has, it hasn't worked out for Kirloff and, and Margot, who's kind of a, you know, a, I would say probably a one-year acquisition. There are going to be some openings here, but we've already seen what Matt Wallner's kind of done, hot and cold, but like when he's hot, he's really hot. And there's more on the way. Again, I just look at this overall, I know there are probably a lot of Twins fans who would probably disappointed about how little they did at the deadline, but I kind of look at it and say, personally, I look at it and say, this is a team that's 16 games over 500 right now. And it, without getting a scooble or someone like that, which they were never going to get, especially in division, if I, I don't think that they need a whole lot of like, oh, we, got, we added another fifth starter who can make starts for us. They're going to make the playoffs, I think. So if you're not going to be part of their playoff rotation or make their playoff bullpen better, I don't know how useful it is for them to to add it, except for to just eat some innings, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely, you know, an interesting all-around team at this point. And uh, I think just even the development of like, the players at the major league level guys have gotten better for the twins, you know? Um, and as I said, like it looked like it was going the wrong direction coming out of 2020 and some of those drafts where some of their picks didn't materialize. Some guys that we thought had high upside have dealt with injuries like a riot, et cetera. They've been able to backfill 
They've done really well in the international market as well. There's a guy that I don't even think is on this top 30 in Eduardo Beltre that's going to be that helium prospect this week. Um, who's a really oh, interesting 28 player. on our list. Oh, is he 28? Well, there you go. We got him in. But like, yeah, I mean, there's 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 a lot really at every level where you could see a twins affiliate and you're gonna see a guy that has above average regular tools. And not every team can say that. So that's our look at the AL Central. Uh, you know, we'll keep this rolling. AL West coming next. But thank you for the download. If you enjoyed this, please like or sub and subscribe. And you, so as we keep these coming. But thank you, as always, to the Baseball America subscribers. For Jeff, I'm JJ. So long, everybody.